with me. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be ever acceptable in your sight, our Lord and our Redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. You know, the writer of Luke is all about women. It stands out how many women in Luke are brought up, more so than in the other Gospels or any of Paul's letters. Luke likes women and talks about women and gives them their time in the sunshine of the Gospel. Women supported Jesus' ministry, says so right here. Women of means provided the funds necessary for him and his disciples to travel from town to town to be put up and to be fed. There were 12 disciples, all men. They often got all the credit, but the women were the ones who did the dirty work, who put the foot on the table, kept the roof over their heads, and kept Jesus in a place where he could minister to so many. There are different versions of this story in all four Gospels, and the details vary greatly, but I think it's in Luke that we get these details about women coming forward. The interpreter's task here and everywhere in the Bible, in my opinion, is not to attempt to reconstruct and to take out all contradictions between the individual stories in the gospel, but to attempt to understand the meaning behind the message of each biblical text, this one included. Jesus is doing what Jesus does so often. He's eating with folks, but this time it's with someone maybe we wouldn't have expected Jesus to eat with. He was always eating with sinners, tax collectors, prostitutes, always going to the folks that needed him most. But here, he's coming into the home of a Pharisee who has invited him. No doubt a curious man wanting to know more about this prophet that everyone was talking about. Jesus doesn't believe in reverse discrimination here, you see though he has his own opinions about many of the Pharisees. He's willing to go and sit down with him and eat. And in comes this woman. Is she barging in? No. It's not a home like we have a home, with a front door, perhaps a porch. It's a courtyard area open onto the street to catch the breezes as they come in. Probably a colonnade out front, maybe a tiny fountain of some kind. And you would often eat outside. So it wasn't quite the social taboo to walk in to speak. And we talk, or Jesus tells the story of this woman touching his feet. Well, again, it's not the way you would have imagined. Sitting at your dining room table, someone crouched underneath it, taking care of your feet. Not at all. They were reclined, eating in the Greek way, laying with their feet behind them, facing a small, low table. So her presence would have not been quite as intrusive as we would have imagined. And feet, in this time were filthy. Remember what roads we're talking about. Dusty and dirty, full of refuge, animal waste, human waste. In fact, the roads outside would have been like an open sewer. And to walk through those, feet would have been the most disgusting part of your body. I often preach at Monday, Thursday, when we do the foot washing here, that there was a law that said you could not compel your slave to wash your feet. That's how disgusting feet were. But every proper homeowner 
would have a basin by the door for you to stop and wash your own feet before you come in. Now this Pharisee starts talking about this woman who he knows to be a great sinner and telling Jesus to send her away. But he doesn't do this. In fact, he turns it back on the Pharisee so quick and said, look at what she is doing for me. You did not even bother to put a basin out to water my feet. Jesus loves to tell a story that causes the hearer to pronounce judgment on themselves. You see, he's putting the Pharisee in his place when he points a finger at a greater sinner. Now the denarii story is a good one. A denarii was worth about a day's wages. And the one who owed 500 denarii would have owed a year and a half's worth of salary to someone. Whereas someone who owned 50 would be so much easier to resolve. In other words, in this story, someone who has sinned a lot and someone who has sinned a little. The one less so, in this case, the Pharisee is thinking that he's not as bad as this woman. Both are forgiven. They are both on the same level. And this is so hard for this Pharisee and for us, too, to grapple with. We know our sins, and they're little sins, right? They're sins with a small s, not a capital S, like this woman standing right in front of you, wiping your feet, Jesus. And right here, right at this point, is where I think the meaning of all of this is. It's easy for us to think that someone else's sin is greater than our own, but not in God's eyes. Sin is sin, whether it's a capital S sin as we judge it in the 21st century, or if it's a little s sin. So when I look at this reading in all of these stories that are being shared, the woman washing Jesus' feet, the story about the denarii, what I see is equality. I see Joanna and Susanna, and I see Mary Magdalene's name being brought up by Jesus, and I see all sin being given the same weight. Lots of equality messages happening here. So folks, if there's someone in your life that needs forgiveness, or someone in your life that you need to ask for forgiveness, regardless of how great the debt or the wrong, I want you to find a way to extend that forgiveness or to ask for it. Jesus did to the point of dying for those big S sins and the little s sins. Thankfully, none of us have to go that far. Amen.